Okay, great. I don't see any more questions, at least right at this moment. And so uh, we're going to uh, move on to our last speaker. Uh, let's see, uh, Caroline uh, Alderson. Hopefully she can take over the screen from me. Um, Caroline is a conservator with the Center for Historic Building at the General Services Administration. Her primary program responsibility is preservation policy reporting and technical guidance. She has an MS from Columbia's preservation program and began her career with the National Park Service's Technical Preservation Services, but has worked for GSA's preservation program regionally and nationally for 33 years. Caroline is an Association for Preservation Technology Fellow and co-chair of APT's Technical Committee on Modern Heritage and past president of APT's DC chapter. She also served on the Montgomery County, Maryland Historic Preservation Commission and co-wrote the Images of America book on Tacoma Park, Maryland. So uh, Caroline, are you able to take over the screen? Yes, let me go ahead and click on share. Um, I am getting the share signal, my entire screen, and I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint and let me see if you are getting slideshow. Okay. Do you have the full screen? I think we do. Great. If it's a okay. black, black screen with GSA on it. Yes, except that I think we got the <laughs> the end. Uh, let me see if I can roll it all the way back. Okay. Way. The fast version backwards. <laughs> no, no, no. Just in case you miss anything, here it all is. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, really are. quick. Um, we consider ourselves in some ways close cousins with the um, Park Service, even though I guess maybe you consider us a little more sort of commercial as the government goes, um, because GSA was created um, as part of a broad move in the 30s to um, look at opportunities uh, within the government for improved efficiency and savings in things that we procure a lot of. And so um, one whole section is pens, pencils things, equipment, uh, others, infrastructure, we supply that, but a big part of what we do is public buildings. Um, we inherited incredible inventory. I'm going to give you a really um, rapid armchair tour because it's such a treat uh, for us to work with these buildings. You'll see why I love my job. Uh, and I'll also mention that as um, one of the reasons we consider ourselves close cousins with the Park Service is that we're very nepotistic. Uh, we probably have the biggest preservation program in the country of all the federal agencies, uh, kind of arm in arm with the Park Service. We have 11 regions. We have at least one preservationist um, with an advanced degree in every single one. Some have several. Um, so preservation is very integral with what we do. Um, I came from the Park Service. My boss, uh, I'd been there a few years, been at GSA 33. My boss had been there 25 or so. Now she's been with GSA a handful who runs the National Preservation Program. We have two that just went over. Uh, we do trade back and forth um, in a very collegial way. And with that, let me launch into what we at GSA are about, because I know we have just a few minutes. Um, we're about public buildings. Uh, first and foremost, we are the principal um, civilian agency landlords. We provide all kinds of workspace for civilian agencies. Um, custom houses here in Portland, Maine, um, uh, courthouses, this is in San Juan, Puerto Rico, um, this one's still in use, Court of Appeals in San Francisco, the custom house in Charleston, still in use, very beloved, uh, they have concerts on the lawn in the summer, um, agency headquarter buildings, this is in the Federal Triangle, uh, this is where your attorney general lives <laughs> during the day, um, uh, post offices, and sometimes post offices combined with courthouses, the post office controls the building, if it's principally occupied by the post office, if it's principally occupied by the courts or other federal agency, we control and manage the building. Then there are buildings that have lived many uses. Um, these are beloved uh, community landmarks. This one, the um, where the pensioners from the Civil War used to line up and get their checks, has uh, now the National Building Museum right in downtown Washington. Get there if you can. Uh, and this one, oldest uh, federal uh, public building west of the Mississippi, um, Pioneer Courthouse in uh, Portland, Oregon, still in use as the courthouse. Another one, still in use as the courthouse in Cleveland, Ohio, built in the early 20th century, magnificent Besenbaum Courthouse, also still in use, serving its original use, but uh, the custom service only occupies a small portion 
of the New Orleans Custom House, um, and uh, it's now occupied also by a number of other agencies. Courts have offices. The State Department has offices. Um, so, as in our position as a the agency for the federal government, one of the kinds of things we can do is help to fill the vacancies so that the buildings stay viable for use. Federal agencies uh, pay into what's called the public buildings fund. They play, pay um, commercially based rents, so they rent, they pay for the amount of space they use. In other words, the more space they use, the more they pay. So if they don't need it all, they want to let go. And then our job is to fill the space up. And we're going to show you some of the imaginative ways we sometimes need to do that. This one, again, uh, has been in continuous use as a, uh, a uh, courthouse in Savannah. It is just being uh, modernized now, and beautifully so. Uh, and the Custom House in Savannah, also still in use, serving its original use. What you're seeing is a really blurry um, a screenshot I did um, to kind of jump to. I'm going to jump middle to end. Uh, uh, Julie kindly mentioned that one of the things I do is handle our reporting, uh, the most important reporting we do every th three years in compliance with um, Section 3 of Executive Order 13287, Preserve America. So we send a report every three years, kind of how are we doing in our stewardship. Um, there are many aspects to what we do. Um, I'm going to touch on those in just a minute, but you can see the whole series online. If you just do GSA, Google GSA Historic Preservation, that will lead you to our present page, pay, preservation page. Stroll down down to stewardship and you'll see this whole series of what we send every three years that's going to cover um, many of the kinds of case studies that I'll show you um, very briefly today. So five ways uh, a civilian government landlord can use historic buildings. The first and most obvious, keep them in use serving their original purpose. This is an office building, quite a nice office building <laughs> in the Federal Triangle. Originally it was the headquarters of the post office in the 1930s. Uh, later it, uh, the Justice Department occupied it and now uh, the Environmental Protection Agency occupied it. Then um, the, our second most elaborate and significant, architecturally significant building in the inventory is the Alexander Hamilton Custom House in New York. Uh, it is not served in Lower Manhattan. You can't miss this if you're heading down to the ferry. Uh, and it has not served as a custom house for many years, but uh, it has served other agencies. Now the courts occupy the upper portion and the lower portion is the Museum of the American Indian. So we're still trying to find ways to get the public in the building. And in fact, in buildings like this that are very special, public space like this rotunda, we look for extra ways to get the public in. Section 111 of the National Historic Preservation Act authorizes us to lease um, spaces that we're not needing uh, for uh, to non-federal entities, but we also can do that for events. So we're using it fairly creatively. Uh, this rotunda uh, is technically controlled by the courts, but they don't need it all the time, and they're very happy to um, see public uses for events and things that let um, let the, the taxpayers that maintain these buildings um, come inside and enjoy them. Um, here's another example. What do we do when um, it's not cut? It's in Washington. We need a lot of office space, but this one wasn't really the right fit for any federal agency, in part because of a tremendous amount of common area. Common area is the corridors, the lobbies, and such. Um, we need actually needed more office space. Um, and this was the very first monumental post office in Washington, built in the 1840s, um, with additions 20 years later. One of the most significant buildings in the city. Um, and we uh, we, we made the decision to keep this in federal ownership and stewardship, uh, but it is now serving as a boutique hotel. And you can go uh, in the courtyard, you'll find the original uh, postal processing center that is a lovely restaurant. When we don't have federally owned space, we look to opportunities to lease, um, or when we don't have GSA controlled space, we look for opportunities to lease um, non-federal property. This one actually uh, was a brewery in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, that uh, the post office initially acquired, and then we are actually we are leasing the portions they don't need um, for lots of federal agencies. And um, it's so you can see. I mean, this has kept the building. Kept the building maintained and in use um, at Real Town Center, masterpiece. And sometimes we have a sweet story like this. Um, as I mentioned, the size of the agency ebbs and flows quite a lot with demographics. So where we have towns that are downsizing, we often have agencies that are downsizing, including the federal courts. In Vicksburg, Mississippi, our courts were actually shrinking to the point that our courthouse was only half full. 
we couldn't really um, maintain it when we're bringing in rent for only half the building. Um, we transferred, we conveyed that courthouse that we were only half using to the state of Mississippi. And in the meantime, Natchez stepped up and asked if we might be interested in having the Natchez Memorial Hall from the 1850s. It had been vacant for many years. They were hoping to get it occupied by a public entity that would keep the building at the level of stature that it does in Natchez. Uh, it was a lovely fit. So uh, we have transferred now where we own and occupy what is our most diminutive <laughs> little historic courthouse in the federal inventory. A real success story. And here you see the courtrooms in the in the in the middle of the building. There wasn't much uh, left inside, so it was a good, easy retrofit. Um, and uh, we take a lot of pride in that. Many of these buildings, uh, they, uh, you know, building like this is obviously built to last. They were built of very fine materials. This custom house in Philadelphia in the 1930s, magnificent, magnificent lobby. Uh, and agencies love these buildings, and um, they wear well enough that, that many of them are still serving their original use including this one. Um, but let's look at some of the issues that crop up. I know we have just a few minutes, so I'm going to really breeze through um, case studies that you can learn lots more about going online. You can either Google the case or go to our Extending the Legacy reports, and uh, we have covered many of these kinds of case studies. One of the big burning issues, of course, is um, that many of our buildings that nobody ever thought would be historic became historic as, um, as the buildings of the uh, 50s and 60s began to mature. These are buildings actually built by GSA as a fledgling agency after we took over um, kind of the inventory of the Treasury Department uh, public buildings and we began to, after the war, have a need for additional space. This is the uh, a building occupied by uh, Housing and Urban Development in Washington, D.C. as their headquarters, model after uh, Breuer's design for UNESCO. And here's another one, Chicago Federal Center, a landmark complex by um, by Mies van der Rohe, and these are among the buildings that are real icons. They were no-brainers. We always knew they were significant. We always treated them uh, as buildings that would be eligible, and um, and so being well-maintained, it has been easy to continue them in their original uses, uh, but sometimes it's not so easy. Here we have um, a courthouse. Uh, you saw our lovely Cleveland uh, early 20th century courthouse, but Cleveland, of course, was a growing city, and this building was added in 1967. One of the challenges we have with buildings of this era, this is one that isn't quite an icon. Uh, it's something that falls in between. We did a very scholarly eligibility determination, determined it not eligible, uh, but the community disagreed, and so we decided to do what we could to at least make them part way. But uh, some of these buildings performed very, very badly. Um, and this one, oh, just an energy hole, a infiltration, just everything. The facade was not working out. It wasn't designed to last for 50, 60, or 100 years. And so this one, as a, and I definitely say this is a compromise, not our preferred way to go. Um, we put a jacket around it. I mean, the, the old building is underneath. This is not um, normally our preferred approach. Um, but the project was kind of far along at the point at which we decided, well, um, we'll, we'll accept that determination, but um, we may not be able to keep this facade as is because it just has to keep the tenants dry and it has to be able to perform um, cost effectively. Um, some of the other interesting ones, sometimes uh, a building may be much more significant than it would appear on the surface. This uh, may not look like much on the back side of our Montgomery Courthouse, but it's an extremely significant building that is uh, the location of the uh, Montgomery uh, boycott, the bus station, the Greyhound bus station where the boycott occurred that began to set in motion the Civil Rights Act of 19. 65. So incredibly significant. Uh, we can't really use it for a courtroom. <laughs> it's a little bit small, but um, the state of Alabama has partnered with us. And um, I wish I could show you the finished version. It is now a civil rights museum. Oh, there you do see the finished version. I think on opening day, a great success and a nice story for the judges. They are very proud to have this role in promoting the history. And um, last, uh, last but not least, this is one of our personal favorites uh, because uh, it, it's not always easy working on a solution with an agency. We do, um, we do consider them our clients. They are our tenants. We have to come up with solutions that they accept. Often, when a um, an agency is outgrowing space, it often wants a big 
spanking brand new building that will consolidate in and will have all the bells and whistles of what they can build today. And uh, so we often have big, uh, lively debates <laughs> with the federal courts. Uh, but this one, I, I'd say we had a very progressive presence uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania. They were very conscious that there had been some vacancies in the town. This is like right off the town square, very central, important location to the town. And uh, the courts occupied, that had occupied this courthouse since the 30s were aware that there were some very significant buildings that were vacant around them. And they stepped up the plate to say, we can use those. And in fact, uh, the city stepped forward as the courts uh, said, said, yes, we can be flexible. And they offered us the Erie Public Library. Um, and again, uh, we have a very reciprocal relationship. Uh, the federal government, states, and city governments both have, uh, usually have reciprocal authorities that let them transfer directly to another public entity as what would be called a public benefit conveyance. And so they transfer to this, uh, no fee as a public benefit conveyance. It has made, uh, as you can see, uh, town center landmark. Um, we're proud to be able to use it for the federal courts. They love the building. And Erie was very happy to get this corner reactivated. The library had been closed. Um, we even managed to persuade the post office substation to locate in that little corner building that was at Art Modern Clothing Store. And then you'll see kind of sprouting out of the middle rather organically, a very sympathetic uh, addition that accommodated the remainder of the amount of square footage the courts needed. So, you know, a happy ending. None of these come easily. Um, lots of uh, technical design um, challenge and lots of often negotiating with the agencies, but um, it's worth every minute of it. And um, there you can see the three buildings um, that have been united together. And here you see uh, our uh, little, little gateway, very diminutive gateway that is meant to recognize and honor the historic buildings um, that flank it. And um, with that, I'll wrap and I guess ask you uh, if you have any questions, if we have a minute for questions. Oh, thank you so much. That is very brief, but uh, good stuff. Um, I had a, a quick question, if you have a moment, Caroline, um, about GSA and do they ever deaccession their buildings? And if so, under what circumstances? Yes, and I, of course I, I raced through that, so you didn't get much on our authorities. But um, it, we, when you look at the stewardship reports, the last thing I have, I always have first how we reuse them, how we adapt them, <laughs> how we keep them in federal ownership when we can. not But of course, actually, you'll know um, uh, Congress way prefers if we're not using the building to have us deaccession it. Um, sometimes the hope is that we'll make a whole lot of money selling it. But actually, if it's a landmark, we're going to look first for an opportunity for a public benefit conveyance that will keep the building public. Uh, that is a, a priority for us as far as our policy policy and our procedures go if it's a if it's a really important community landmark uh, we have several authorities uh, we can do disposal different ways and we try to choose the authority that fits both the building and the circumstances the market uh, and so the first one we always try we have what's called a filtering so the first thing we do if a building um, an agency is not able to uh, fully occupy a building um, where it's really vacant or half vacant or they're leaving town uh, is to look for uh, can other federal agencies uh, occupy that building or help to fill the gap. So that's the first thing we do, uh, do is put out the call to other agencies to um, occupy the vacant space. If the other agencies don't step forward, then we turn to um, the public benefit entities. Usually, the first thing is usually reaching out to the city or the state. We will probably already been talking to the uh, state historic preservation officer saying we're anticipating a potential conveyance. Uh, and would you let us know if there are opportunities you think we should even pursue? Um, we're always in touch with the towns, too, because the towns are very concerned about the federal government leaving uh, a principal public building. So we stay in very close touch with them. Sometimes they will suggest uh, possibilities. Um, SHPOs sometimes know of possibilities. So we do reach out to the governments. Um, the other thing we do in looking for possibilities is those aren't the only public benefit uses. Some are as uh, a government uh, building. Others are educational use. That's a big one. We have a lot that, and we can engage in these public benefit conveyances um, for uh, universities. Um, even we had one that was a high school, <laughs> really sweet 
I would love to have gone to that uh, high school in uh, Albuquerque. But um, they make do beautiful colleges. Uh, in fact, um, one of our loveliest ones, uh, a custom house in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, is occupied at, by that city as many things. It's, it's their courthouse um, and under uh, the Monument Conveyance Authority, um, which is also sometimes called the Surplus Property Authority. The Park Service works with us on these conveyances. They're some of our special, and we you have used them for some of our very most significant buildings nationwide. The San Francisco Mint is one. That one's still in development. But um, St. Louis, I'd say, in fact, if you want to look at a case study that is one of the most taught case studies in reuse, um, it's, I think there was a college class that was really centered on this, this particular case study. It's the St. Louis Custom House. Um, we had built a, a big courthouse that I'd honestly say was too big, uh, and so we vacated what was a spectacular um, custom house that was very much the center of this town. And um, the state, uh, we did a monument authority conveyance that that authority allows the um, receiving entity, like the state, to uh, occupy. Uh, a portion of the building, but also to allow a revenue producing use. So this allowed the state to occupy courtrooms as courtrooms, which was a beautiful fit. The lower level is occupied by Webster University, and the first floor level is completely public. It houses the public library and a newspaper. So, uh, and maybe a Starbucks in between. But, you know, it's like the perfect thing. The building's completely reactivated. It's more public than ever. Uh, and that, the reason that when it was taught as a case study, is it took uh, extremely imaginative development economics. The person that did that, uh, I think, is he teaches the course um, because he used more incentives than I've ever seen any developer stack up. He really knew his incentives, tax credit, but everything under the sun, every credit he could. And sometimes that ability to be very creative about the financing is what fills all the gaps and lets um, kind of the magic happen. And so that's our, uh, I'd say, what is our, our first choice when we have a very significant building. And then we have other buildings that really aren't that significant. And really the thing is to actually turn them back over for other active uses. So um, the next pu next uh, option is public sale. Um, if it is a national register or a national register eligible building, we're always transferring it with preservation covenants uh, that will preserve what's significant. Um, sometimes that handoff comes with a building preservation plan that basically is the recipe how to take care of this building. Um, and then, um, so, so in most cases, almost every case, I'm not aware of any significant building ever having to be demolished. Um, we've always found uh, a taker by, uh, by public benefit or, or sale. In rare cases, we're transferring a property that may have some other significance, might be archaeological. Uh, or it's um, some um, of the military properties that we've disposed of have, have made sometimes serious hazmat problems and the buildings were industrial, very deteriorated, have limited reuse potential. So sometimes in those cases we're looking at um, putting out a, uh, an RFP for what's the best the market could offer. Is anybody available that can reuse it and sometimes they can't and so then we work out other kinds of mitigation. Great. Thank you so much, Carolyn. That's wonderful. You're, you're so welcome. And sorry, that was a, a really power-packed uh, short um, lesson on GSA disposal, but you could also find more in, you know, going online, a lot of case studies, and I'm happy to share more later. So we have uh, email addresses for each of our participants, but I think people were also very good about uh, sharing uh, that information uh, during their PowerPoint presentations. Uh, I also want to share with you uh, a list, I believe this is here, of our future webinars uh, hosted by Nick P and others. Uh, the next one sponsored by Nick P uh, takes place on August 11th. Uh, it's Tuesday at two o'clock. Uh, an introduction to National NAGPRA and the Tribal Historic Preservation Program. Uh, and we have others by um, um, that are on the list um, that also sound really fascinating. If you're, again, if you're interested in NAGPRA, uh, the one partnering with tribes on conservation on August 5th also sounds fascinating. But also uh, on the 22nd of July, sharing untold stories, please take a look at that one as well. And I can share with you uh, the links. Uh, I'm happy to do that. Just put the information in chat or write to me or to Paloma uh, at our email addresses here. 
Uh, I want to thank our amazing panelists and to Paloma for participating and sharing their programs with our audience. Uh, it was so much information packed into such a short period of time, uh, but you all did a great job. And thank you to all our attendees for sticking with us and for your great questions. It was fabulous. Um, I have recorded this webinar. It will be uploaded to YouTube in about a week from now. Uh, and then closed captioning and a transcript uh, available about a week after that, uh, in case you missed it or want to relive the experience. Thank you very much, uh, panelists. And uh, let's see, um, unless there's anything else, I'll say so long. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Julie. Thank you, Paloma. It was great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.